you know your business better than anyone, including the VCs you're talking to. And I think it's important that founders remember that so they don't get kind of beat up by VCs telling you your thesis is wrong. Like as a startup founder, you are objectively, your job is to see the future and you're gonna do something that most people don't believe in. And so you just have to feel so much confidence in yourself and the idea that you can make that future happen regardless if other people believe you or not. Get ready for the Product Tea with Leah, your fun-sized dose of business, tech, growth, and product chatter. I'm your host, Leah, and it's time to spill the tea. Welcome to the Product Tea. Once upon a time, someone wished for a magical tool to understand the romantic dances between customers and product and sales. When that didn't appear with a Hocus Pocus wave, she just built it herself. Co-founding Pocus during her casual days at Stanford because why would you just study while you're there? The once hacky solutions transformed into a spellbinding startup. Earning sparkles on Farb's Cloud 100 Rising Stars list, she has turned product data into a magical realm of understanding. Who needs a wand when you have got data wizardry like hers? Give it up for our own data enchantress for sales, Alexa Grabel. How are you doing this morning? Wow. Thank you so much for that intro. I had high expectations and you exceeded those expectations for the introduction. That is the objectively correct answer. Thank you so (laughs) much. Can you introduce yourself to the fools that may not know you? Yes, I'm Alexa. I am the CEO and co-founder of Pocus. We are a product-led sales platform. So we help sales teams at PLG companies like Asana, Miro, Webflow, First, their product usage data to do things like drive conversion, upsell, expansion. So I'm in San Francisco and I'm excited to chat. That is pretty cool. And I think you're one of these people that have a win-win relationship with me potentially because I'm one of these people that are trying to use or like also talk my own clients into using tooling that you are actually providing. So as a growth advisor, I'm very happy that tools like this exist and that we do not have to resort to deal qualification over Google Analytics, which is not that cool, I think. That's, that's the goal. <laughs> I'm happy you're happy, Leia. <laughs> Makes me happy in return. <laughs> oh, that's very nice. I knew that this is going to turn into a marketing and sales-led uh, call, but <laughs> here we are. Alexa, what do people get wrong about you once did you know you? Love this question. I tend to not take myself seriously. I like to have a lot of fun and joke around and kind of be like a hype woman sometimes. But I think that might confuse people to thinking I'm not intense. I can definitely get into hardcore execution mode and kind of put on my tough Alexa hat to get things done. So I think I can come across as cheery and, you know, don't take myself seriously, but can be pretty intense. This is really interesting because I think you're one of the first people that formulated it in this way. I had a somewhat similar experience when I was <laughs> younger. <laughs> so we were joking in the pre-talk about our ages. Ah. So I think for me, I always looked very young for my age. And that resulted to me looking like a toddler when I was like 18. And that is not very cool in a business context as well. And I think if you also have kind of like an outgoing or energetic kind of way of doing things, people tend to maybe not take you seriously in the first mm-hmm. place. So that can definitely happen. This was definitely the case for me as well. Yeah, it's, it's just like this combination of being young and just not playing this game of, oh, you know, like I have to appear professional from the very first second on mm-hmm. that can actually backfire a little bit. I think I'm right now at a point where I'm fortunate to kind of building a brand around this, but was this also your experience in some way that you did you kind of notice that wouldn't call it ageism, but like this kind of combination of it's getting harder to just establish trust with some people just because of the appearance that it gives. Yeah, I mean, we can talk about this for the full hour. (laughs) It's a great question. I have a lot of thoughts. And yeah, before the we started recording, we were talking about how I I look very young and I have young energy. I'm actually a little older than I look. (laughs) But that does come across as a lot of people will at first glance think I am young and not have that experience, I think use it to your benefit and you have to read your audience. So when I'm talking to maybe a CIO of a public company that I'm trying to sell, I might put on a little bit more of a serious tone. But if I'm recruiting more junior sales reps to join my team, 
it's a benefit to have this kind of fun, optimistic vibe where people feel like they can come to work and be themselves. So I think I've figured out ways to use this energy as my benefit in different parts of the company building. Did you ever feel like it's hard to put up your boundaries, like when you start to hire people like this, because I also did the same for myself, also in my startups, that it may be easier for hiring people, but then also at the same time, you kind of have to put up boundaries that, look, I'm a fun person, but sometimes I'm going to put the foot down because if the quota is not reached or like whatever you have Mm -hmm. as goals or incentives or whatever, sometimes we have to make hard calls. So was this also something where you kind of had to wake up because I feel like, so this is your first VC back, I mean, first one. <laughs> it sounds like you need to have five in life. Oh. <laughs> Don't advise me. Do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I do. I've been very intentional with team building. I've never used the word family when talking about focus. I think we're a team. Mm-hmm. In families, you can't fire people or promote people, but in teams, you can. And so what I've also realized is so long as you're winning and kind of landing new logos, shipping new features, that's more important than anything. Like being on a winning team and being part of that energy and feeding off of each other is what people crave more than, you know, we're going to go to a bar after work. So that is what I've leaned into. And I definitely think everyone on the team knows kind of I'm their boss, I'm the CEO, but I also want to have fun while we're building this together because it's a tough journey. Yeah, and I think it's funny that you say like that you avoid trying to call it a family. Like I have a better connection with most of my colleagues with my family. So <laughs> so there's that. <laughs> I hope my family doesn't listen to this podcast. <laughs> Especially in the early days, there's experiences where you're in the weeds. Like you are really grinding it out. And I spend way more time with my team than I do with my friends and family at this point. So you need to have that relationship. But it's also our job at the end of the day is to create a multi-billion dollar generational company, not to kind of have fun together. But while doing that, you can have fun along the way. Okay, this is the proof that that you were in VC meetings. You used the word multi-generational because that's what we learn when we go to funding rounds and (laughs) just pitch our multi-billion dollar ideas to the biggest funds. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. I know how it is. It's fine. It's also in my <laughs> vocabulary. I also had to learn it at some point. You know, like you cannot talk about hundreds of thousands of dollars. You have to always pick out, pick out the billions. <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. What it <laughs> exactly. Um, so how are things going? I mean, the economy is in the shitter. Some mm-hmm. of your competitors are folding. I mean, we're talking about Calixa right now specifically. That was a relatively recent announcement. I mean, relatively direct competitor. How are things going right now from your sales perspective? Like, why are you betting on this in the broadest sense on product-led sales or like data-driven sales? Did you read my mind? I sent out my investor update right before I joined this podcast. So yeah, I'm on it. I'm I'm, I'm actually leading the round. (laughs) I'm actually going to loop you into the future one. So you can just like tell me what to write before I write them because clearly you can see right, right into me. So things, we're very fortunate that things are going well. In a market downturn, what companies care about is doing more with less accelerating pipeline and sales rep efficiency. And I feel grateful that our product touches all of those things. And so we've been able to tie ourselves to revenue and tie ourselves to helping companies, even in a downturn, even when they're doing RIP, even when they lay off sales reps and kind of all of a sudden they have a smaller sales team and they need to do still 2X, generate 2X pipeline. So we feel fortunate that we've been able to you know, ride the wave almost of the downturn. And I actually think given where we are as a company, a little bit of luck of the stage we're at, right? Like we raised enough money to, and we have the kind of inflow to get us through the next four plus years. But at the same time, we didn't get so far along that we just fired a bunch of sales reps and growth at all costs. So we were able to always think efficient growth from the start and have a lean, mean team going after this, which... I feel very grateful for. It's a little bit of intentional from us, but also transparently a little bit of luck of when Focus was founded and when we raised our rounds. Yeah, it is an interesting thing anyways, because I feel like it is relatively clear that most companies are moving in some ways either to product being product led and there's also yep. for sales companies that just have to focus much more on this, like whether you're going up market or whether you just want to like make, as you said, your pipeline more efficient. The interesting bit on why I also personally believe that product led sales or this data-driven selling, and in some ways also mm-hmm. marketing sometimes, mm-hmm. is the future is because you usually, unless correct me if I see this wrong, but the companies that you're going into, they always have an existing pipeline. Mm-hmm. So they have something that can be optimized 
which means we don't have to worry about traction. Your ACVs are not just going to blow up after six months and they're just like, yeah, well, we like your product, but <laughs> fortunately we're just now, we're going under. And optimizing these, exi- these existing pipelines, this is a difficult thing. And I actually wrote an article about this, which is quite interesting in the sense of if you are a customer that is looking for some kind of solution to make yourself more efficient, which everybody mm-hmm. says, right? It's like, oh, I have to be more efficient. Everybody says that all the time, of course. The question is not so much did you have a good tool. You just need to have the best stuff that is available right now in the market because otherwise you're starting to get disrupted. Because if you're not doing it, then you're going to mm-hmm. compete against pipelines who are not being optimized. It means yep. for the 30000 that you are investing because you know to whom you reach out, you can do much more than the other competitor that is in an inefficient pipeline. And I think I'm not quite sure whether people really understand that this is happening, but I'm definitely betting 100%. And this is also why I went full-time advising exactly mm-hmm. on this particular part and not on PLG in B2C. It's really PLG for B2B, so product-led sales and how to enable salespeople to not just turn into these 5% conversion cold calling agents yep. that are just miserable their entire yep. day. Ticket takers. Yeah, Exactly. I totally agree with you. The future of go-to-market is data-driven. And whether you're using that data from product usage signals, marketing intent, from graphic actions that the folks have taken or set in the community, it's everything needs to be hyper-personalized at the right time, data-driven. And that's the bet we're taking as well, the future of go-to-market. So just really specifically, so let's say someone comes to you and I hope you're also using your own tool internally Mm -hmm. and not like some other competitors. (laughs) We dog food, or as my head of marketing says, we like to drink our own champagne. So it's a new one I heard. Oh, you drink your own champagne. Oh, that's good. That's yeah. very good. It's a classy okay. way of saying dog fooding. Is your uh, head of marketing drinking on the job? No, but she, you know what? I'm going to not answer that question. <laughs> I don't think so. We're going to find out. <laughs> yeah, she's the best We're head of marketing in the world. So I don't care if she's working on the job, honestly. <laughs> you have to. If you work in marketing, you kind of have to right now. Like it's brutal out there. It's, this is just she's like, this is it. From, uh, from a point of compassion, not the <laughs> not yeah. accusation. I mean, she runs product marketing, community, content, everything, demand gen. So honestly, she deserves to drink champagne as she uses Pocus. Okay. You heard it here first. Yeah. yeah. That sounds good. <laughs> so a very typical Thing. So maybe also like for the timeline that you're on right now, now you're beyond, like you're between rounds, right? So like you should, if I did my research correct, you have raised your last round last year. Yep. And it was a sizable amount. It was good. You're well underway. I think you're doing good. Now you're in this difficult, well, kind of difficult period where things are not that dicey yet, but they're at some point they will start to, you have to think about funding rounds again yeah. and so forth. But like... How is this thing changing for you now, maybe also as a leader for yourself in terms of what has changed? Because you've been there from the inception when it was a pre-seed to now where you have a lot of money to play around. How have things changed and what was different from what you actually expected it to be? Yeah, great question. So we are in a place where we raised our Series A last year. We, in terms of how we operate with spending money, I'd say we're still pretty conservative and a bit frugal in how we spend. We hire once we feel the burning need, not hiring in advance. And so for us, not much has changed in terms of, you know, because we raised the series, they were going to go out and spend a ton of money. What has changed is the people and the team. I used to do everything myself, everything from like writing content to managing every customer relationship to, you know, onboarding new employees. And you know we're still a small team of 25 people, but I have a leadership team now that I really deeply trust and respect. And they're very, very solid. And so what that means is I can like give away my Legos. As There's a good first round article that's called Give Away My Legos. And it's basically yeah. like I can just give away those things and then find bigger, more strategic problems to focus on. So I'd say that has been the biggest difference. And I can talk more about that. I think you also asked kind of what did I expect or not expect yeah it's just like what the difference is between what you expected and what what, except because for me for instance like one big mistake that i made myself and it doesn't have to be a mistake necessarily but just like a different expectation that i had was i really regret in hindsight in two occasions that i did not bring in different co-founders or like Mm -hmm. additional co-founders 
because there's a difference. I mean, you can build your leadership team for sure, but like there is a difference to the dynamic of a co-founder because oh, they sure. are going to stay, right? And uh, something like this, whatever, like whatever comes to your mind. But if you did not make any mistakes, then we can also skip this topic. Of oh, course. I for sure made mistakes. I'll say I'm very lucky with my co-founder. He is a CTO and we have very complementary skill sets, work extremely well together and have pretty, my advice for co-founders is have very different areas of expertise, but also be able to work really well together. So that was not one of my mistakes. I, of course, made a hundred bajillion mistakes. I think the thing that I did wrong early days, every time that something would go wrong or I'd get a no, I'd like really beat myself up and get upset about it or imposter syndrome. Now I kind of laugh it off and it's a way more fun experience. I've definitely over time gotten thicker skin and I'm just like, all right, this no, what did I learn from it? How can I improve? What can I do better? And it almost gives me like more motivation to just crush it in the future. So I think early days, I worried too much when there were so many competitors and what's going to happen, the market's crowded. And now I'm just like, all that matters is put your head down, execute and hire the right people. That is fascinating because there's two things that you actually said that I find quite interesting. So the first one is, I find it very impressive that you already dealt with your imposter syndrome in series A. <laughs> I, think, I think for Leah, it was like series K or something. <laughs> like, yeah. I think it's very interesting because I crashed two startups relatively fast into the wall at some point. They were not VC backed, right? So like just like to put it all in perspective, but we had 25 people on payroll it's at the height of it. Like that was the biggest one where we just made a big mistake. And it was not really a testament for of my business skills. Let's put it that way. This really scratches on your ego, right? But even though, even if you know that most likely your startup is not going to survive, you still retain some of this kind of failure mm -hmm. inside yourself. And I find it very difficult because sometimes you also get up on the wrong side of the bed and everything seems shit. Mm -hmm. It's just what it is, right? So like everything that's coming that day is just like not feeling right. If you get a no from the wrong partner or one of the, um, yeah, you get some kind of cancellation that you did not foresee or something, just like something is, yeah, something is making your day bad. The other thing that you said, I think is very, very important and also highlight quite a lot. And that is this frugality thing. Like, so you said that you're only hiring when there is a burning need. So there's a very specific thing that we also advise around product-led sales. So like, let's say you have a pipeline and you have salespeople that are working on this particular pipeline. Now, what we do usually with product-led sales is we're trying to use in some way activation data mm -hmm. to qualify this pipeline. So we have to kind of wait before these deals are becoming activated before we give them to sales to do something mm -hmm. about it. So one of the first things that I usually do with consulting clients is to tell them to slow down their hiring because the pipeline is just not burning yet. And if it's yeah. not burning, what happens is you grab stuff too early and then you there's no need for data. Like if you handle yeah. all your pipeline before it's activated, why do you need data? Mm -hmm. Data is not for that, right? Like the data is for that you do not need that many salespeople and that you know who to reach out for and that you can close higher in average. So it's mm -hmm. this entire expansion game is very important. But back to your point, I think it's a very important entrepreneur lesson to, to be frugal about this, specifically if you load up on VC cash, because VC cash sometimes gives you, you know, like we always treat like these announcements that oh, we've raised 30 million. That's like, oh, now we're in the clear. No, now you're not in the clear. Now you're exactly on the opposite. Now you need to make it efficient. Exactly. Which you did not have before. Did Was there a point for you where you said, hey, now we should go for VC money? Or was it always clear for you that at some point you're going to go? Um, or was this was the dream of a bootstrapped kind of gig never on the plate? <laughs> so I can <laughs> tell you what happened and it sounds way more kind of intentional and logical than it actually was. So I, I never kind of thought I would be a founder. I never like dreamed of having a company. And I can talk about that journey of how it was my aha to start a company. But sure. I took it in terms of like fast forward a little bit when I took a class at Stanford with my co-founder and that's really where we came up with the idea of focus. And our professor at the end of the class offered us a term sheet and we were like, what? Like we're valued at this for this like idea that we had on a PowerPoint. And so then we were like, okay, we should probably take this seriously. So I waited to graduate. My co-founder dropped out and it kind of, because we got the first term sheet and this was 2021. So it was a very hot time. 
we ended up just having being able to do a quick fundraise based on truly a PowerPoint idea, founder vision. Times are very different now. And then about a year later, what happened is other companies like Endgame and Calixa raised before us. So they started ahead of us. And so there was a lot of excitement from VCs in this product-led space, which then accelerated our timeline. So we just have been building for a year. And then we got kind of proactively engaged by VCs to raise the Series A. So about one year ago, I said, all right, we're getting kind of interest from VCs because the market's hot and the market looks like it's about to go to shit. This is probably the right time to take investment. I don't think this is the normal path or what I would recommend. Was it a mix no. of luck? Like, it's not like I was like, I'm going to hit this metric and then raise. It was old school kind of way of fundraising. The world's different now. Like how I think about it is we got get hit up from VCs all the time. I'm like, I am not fundraising until it's time, until we hit XYZ metric, until we're ready. Just like you said, it's not time for, okay, let's raise around every single year and accelerate growth as possible and hire a bunch of people. It's time to be very efficient and build what I say, like painkiller, not a vitamin. I think there's a lot of vitamins in the world from from VC funding. No. Yeah. And I just want to highlight to people how incredibly stressful putting around together is just like in general, in case someone is listening to this and never has yeah. done that. What it means is you have to get through a lot of no's, even if you have the best startup in the world. Like it's just like the, either the terms do not match, the totally. mission doesn't match, they are not good for you. Or, you know, like sometimes, <laughs> I don't know, the communication methods just don't work. Or yeah. for some reason you get a European VC in that has a different philosophy or whatever. Totally. Whatever it is. Like there's, there's a million things that you can just go wrong. And it is a very, very taxing experience. And um, yeah, you don't want to do this once, once a year. No. And I'll also say, like, I wouldn't tie your worth or your success to whether or not you got VC funding. There are just yeah. so many examples of companies that got a million no's. We got a bunch of no's too. It's you kind of just that's what happens. And you know your business better than anyone, including the VCs you're talking to. And I think it's important that founders remember that so they don't get kind of beat up by VCs telling you your thesis is wrong. Like as a startup founder, you are objectively, your job is to see the future and you're going to do something that most people don't believe in. And so you just have to feel so much confidence in yourself and the idea that you can make that future happen, regardless if other people believe you or not. This is a very interesting thing in terms of what we celebrate, I think, also in tech. I find this very mm-hmm. interesting. So, like, let's say you take a funding round, right? So, you close mm-hmm. the funding round, everybody's happy, and then you make an announcement, of course, because it was a tiring time and so forth. Or you get a new title, like, oh, mm-hmm. I'm the head of something. Wow, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> or you just go, like me, full-time advising. The same thing happens in all three cases. Yeah. People are starting to congratulate you. That's like congratulating people before a race starts. It's just like, Mm -hmm. hey, I'm going to go and participate in this race. Oh, hey, congratulations, you made it. And it's just like, no, actually, it's the entire opposite, right? So why do we make these announcements? And I I, I don't mean this in a bad way, but like also like Forbes under 30 and so forth. Mm -hmm. Like we put a lot of pressure on people in general that they kind of have to perform now to expectations that have been put on Every congratulations is like, hey, you better don't fuck it up, right? (laughs) It's like, don't fuck it up. And I find that quite interesting. And I I have to say that I personally had a lot of problems dealing with this pressure when I just got my, when I got my first head of product title, which was actually Mm -hmm. about 2011. That was 12 years ago. Yeah. It was very difficult for me because you have the title, did not have the skills whatsoever. Crazy Mm -hmm. startup, grew from 20 to 95 people in seven months and exit. (laughs) She never worked in a startup like this before. Like absolutely crazy. Yeah. And at the end of it, there's little congratulations. But at the start of it, you get a lot of it. And I think that's quite interesting. I'm not sure what my point is, but yeah. No, I agree with you. And I'm trying to, we have heads up, but I'm trying to never have titles at Focus. I just want no hierarchy. I want people to be celebrated for the output and the wings and the things they build and contribute, not kind of a promotion. I also say the same thing, whether it's a funding round, whether it's like last week, we just closed our biggest deal ever. It's great. Celebrate the five minutes. Now move on to the next. We're nowhere. We're so early. Who cares about that deal? In three years, that deal is going to be a baby deal. So like, it's kind of like you have to celebrate the wins, but then move on fast because it's not. And I agree. Some of those like 30 under 30 and those type of things, it's, it's silly. Like it's not something that 
transparently or all the, like, we'll get like the cloud 100 or the, there was just like a PLG one. Transparently, great. I'm going to post it on LinkedIn because guess what? It drives leads for POTUS. Am I going to celebrate that to friends and family? Absolutely not. They have no idea what I'm talking about. So it's yeah. kind of like, I don't feel it as, I think they're silly a little, but if they drive leads for focus, great. I don't know if that's a hot take. I think a lot of times people with like, my big learning is a lot of time with people with prestige, whether it's the kind of the award, the university, the company, the title, no. get a lot of celebration. But in my experience with startups, it's way more about the ability to learn fast, think with first principles, execute, hustle, just that drive more than experience or fancy logos. No. And so that's more important. It stays for quite a long time, but let's see how long you can go without titles. Let's see how long we go. Like, I mean, Godspeed to you. Let's, like, let's chat again I'm, in a year. We won't have titles. I mean, we have heads up just because I want people to know who is running this group. But other than that, I don't want managers. I don't want VPs, directors, nothing. It's just... How does this call go? Like, usually you just go to them and you say like, hey, you're a head off, but like, don't tell anyone, okay? You just like, you just need to know who's running. <laughs> no, my leadership team is all heads up. Everyone else just has flat titles. Okay. Everybody has flat titles. Okay, fair enough. No. Okay. I'll keep you posted. Okay. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. I'm also going to start to work as a as a flat advisor for Pocus. No, it's not good. I love I'm it. I'll take it. Flat. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. Do you have any insecurities that you're still dealing with? Like during, so I think you already overcome your, your imposter syndrome. Everything is solved there. Would you still have any, some, huh. some insecurities that you're dealing with? Like, in general with business and, and how do you communicate these also maybe with the company? Because I also may always usually point to be quite open about my vulnerabilities. And this has been, I always wanted to say like a hit with the company. But <laughs> what I meant to say is that they appreciate it if you're just also yeah. vulnerable yourself. But like, so what are you dealing with during the day? Yeah. I mean, there's always insecurities. Like it's funny because there's always going to be something. I'll say, I do think women face this more of the imposter syndrome than men, especially in tech, especially in male-dominated fields. And I try to remind myself of that as well. I, of course, face insecurities of, am I going to be able to close this deal? Am I going to be able to close this round of funding? Am I going to be able to hire this candidate yeah. I want to? Am I going to be able to break out of this market? Like, there's so many things I'm thinking about. I used to struggle with that a lot. And what I found is just, it gets in the way. And it's just an annoying little thing that it's there rather than, me having fun and focusing on the things that matter. And I think I've had imposter syndrome at every stage of my life. When I started a new job, when I went to Stanford, like I've always thought I was the dumbest person in the room, but that's a good thing because that means you're surrounded by people who are smart and pushing you and raising the bar. So to me, I'm at this point where I'm just like, you know what? Having insecurities or imposter syndrome, I can be vulnerable about it and say, you know, this is where I still have question marks about the market or the product or the team. But we're a really freaking smart team. We have a great product. And you know what? We execute like hell. So we're going to figure this out. So that's kind of the new motivation. I'll say having an executive coach has been very helpful for this. I recommend that to all my founder friends and CEOs. Like getting a coach is game changer for kind of working through some of yeah. these, this as well. That is a really good advice. I was just about to knock you on some stuff that you just said, and then you just now you just rescued yourself with the executive coach. Very good. So, no. what are you going to knock me on? I'm ready to. I'm ready to <laughs> beat, Lena. <laughs> I'm ready to fight. So, the couple of things that you mentioned at the start, these are not insecurities. These are just like business challenges, right? But like. I really mean the stuff that makes you cry. If you do cry, I don't know whether you just cried out. <laughs> I also had that sometimes in my professional stage life. <laughs> it was just like, or just, you know, like the things that keep you awake at night. And yeah, that can be market challenges. Sure, for for sure. But I think for myself, let me lead with an insecurity that, yeah. that, that I was dealing with. And you can just like, let's see whether we find something about you in this regard. So first of all, I think I am not sure whether men are dealing less with it. They just definitely never admit to it or like much, much less for it or to it. So Shani Benzer actually said in the last one, in the last recording that we had, she said, I think women are looking at things or jobs in like, oh no, I can only do 60% of this. And then we get mm -hmm. an imposter syndrome and men are like, hey, I can do 60%. I got this. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Of, 100%. So, I don't know where it is, but I do know that men are not talking enough about this, for sure not. Yeah. So, But it would be nice also if more men were to be also speaking up specifically in senior oh, right. leadership roles, because 
And now here comes here comes here comes the perfect circle to your executive coaching. Leah also does executive coaching. And I there we can go. tell you from coaching other senior leaders, we all are cooking with water and we all don't know what the hell we're doing. Yeah. A hundred percent. That's kind of what I was getting at is no one knows what they're doing. You could be at the fastest growing startup and you're making shit up. Like that is kind of what helps me think about this. And that was going back to my point of even if you have so much experience, you don't know what you're doing. Just like you have to be smart and execute. (laughs) Yeah, I think it's, this is funny to me. Like I would consider myself to be an experienced person by some standards in some domains. Sure. Right. So like, I got so you're an advisor. Things. You're not at a 25. It's a little bit different, I think. No, 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 no. Like, I mean, yeah, well now I'm, yeah, but I also had my I, operative role for 24 years. Okay. So like, totally, let's, totally, let's totally. Have my I'm saying you better have experience as an advisor, which I know you do. <laughs> so let's talk okay, about yeah, sure. your operative. <laughs> so the interesting bit is if I, Look at my time in at, at the Jewel or small PDF. It doesn't really matter. The experience of knowing what you're talking about, I feel like comes from a direction that people do not really expect. So what people, what do people expect when you talk about someone is experienced? They think that, oh, they've seen this. They know how to handle everything. Mm-hmm. That is maybe true in half of the cases. Mm-hmm. The other half, I'm just experienced enough to know that, oh, this smells difficult. I don't know why yet. I know something's going to break. Something's going to burn down 100% in this process, even though it looks absolutely pristine. It looks good. But I know something's going to burn down all mm-hmm. the time. And that's also experience. I and agree. I had this really interesting problem with some, you know, C-levels, also co-founders who are very brilliant people. They're extremely smart. But they tend to have this kind of fault where they're not experienced and they think because they're smarter than everybody that they see more than everyone else. Yeah. And that may be true that they are more comprehensive about specific facts or whatever. That's not what entrepreneurship is about. It is about trusting that what you see is not true. That's not the mm-hmm. full picture. You just need to know that like, you know, shit's going to go wrong all the time. And I that agree. was a big learning for me. And that's where I draw my experience from. And frankly, I mean, everybody could do it. <laughs> you just have to believe that you're... Don't trust your eyes. It's just what it is. I agree. I think smart's the wrong word because you can be the smartest person ever and not be a successful entrepreneur. It has to, you also can't have an ego, I think. You need to be able to be willing to be proven wrong and kind of have open debate because, I mean, I'm usually wrong. Like I need someone to tell me why I'm wrong. Like find the kind of gaps that I'm not seeing, which is, I think, the really why you need a strong leadership team. What was your first moment when you got a, um, an executive coach? Like, what was the thing where you were like, oh my God, I cannot handle this? Like, was there a specific problem where you were like, this is something that I need help with very, very specifically? So not exactly. I have a lot of great peers that are founders at similar stages to me, a couple stages beyond through mm-hmm. first round as our seed investor. I've met a lot of founders through them and coach you. And all of the founders I really respected had a coach. And so I was like, what's this coach thing about? Like, why are they getting coached? And so I interviewed five different coaches just to be like, what are people doing these? Like, they're like, therapy, like, what what are we doing here? Then I found a coach that I really just connected with. And I realized one of the biggest things that he's helped me with is it's mostly people problems, I would say, in terms of like how to motivate people and how to lead and how to fire fast and that type of stuff, which when you're a founder or CEO, you don't have a boss. <laughs> so there's no one to kind of run these ideas by. So it's nice to have a sounding board. So I did it almost as a proactive measure, knowing that I will have more people and hairy problems in the future. No, this was an interesting experience for myself as well. I think about four years ago, I said to myself, okay, I'm going to give this a try again. I'm going to go for a CPO role. It's just like, that was my career plan. Like become a CPO. Like that was Leah at her intellectual height. Yeah. Like I need a CPO title. It's just in case it's not clear, I'm being very, very sarcastic here. You should not just go for titles. It's not a good growth plan. <laughs> Anyways, so I had a huge mirror board on like, how am I going to achieve this? It was very funny. Like I have an actual mirror board. <laughs> and... I'm very methodical in this way, right? So like I knew, okay, what do I suck at? It This, 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 and this, and this. And I need to just become better at it. And as a CPO, which is ironic because you're a leading product, you also need to become good at marketing and you need to know how sales works and you need yep. to understand company fundamentals and so forth. 
So I went out and I started to interview these coaches, just like you, not the same ones as far as I'm aware. So I went through four in my case, I had a very yeah. esoteric experience with one of them. <laughs> it did not click at all. But it is like you said, it's like with one of them, I really connected. And I was just like, okay, that's the guy. That's what mm-hmm. I'm going for. That's the one person that I actually need. And it took mm-hmm. me quite a long time to find someone. And I would say this was exactly the same experience that I had also in my private life. If you have, if you need therapy or like if you're mm-hmm. going through something, do not settle for something where it doesn't click. Mm-hmm. And for me, specifically, like an executive coach, and I'm now making some advertising for myself, but like we seem to be expensive on paper. And it's true, you know, like, I mean, if you, depending on who you get, you're going to pay a lot of money yeah. per hour. But if you think about it and you kind of turn it around and like what the impact is for the company that you're yep. in, because now you're starting to be leveraged across totally. everything, you sometimes just don't know what you don't know. Exactly. And these inputs were very, very valuable for me. So it's not about, oh, you I pay $1,000 per hour for this particular person. It was more like, hey, for $1,000, I got an actually good framework here that I'm going to use yep. for years, years, years to come. I 100% agree. My exact coach actually also coaches my co-founder as well as our head of product. And my goal is he can coach our entire leadership team. We're just, that's a series B thing. <laughs> we don't have the funding for it right now. But we... <laughs> Something I will say that whether or not you can afford an executive coach, something that I think is really, really powerful is feedback and feedback for your blind spots. So something that my coach did within the first couple of months is he actually set up an hour with everyone on my leadership team and asked questions about me of like my working style, what they like, what they don't like, what am I missing? What am I good at? What are they more into? And having a third party do that was really, really game changing for me. And really both, A, I think probably helps with my imposter syndrome of, wow, people think I am a good leader, but also helped me being like, wow, I'm really shitty at this one part of my job and I need to figure out how to get better at it. So I think you can do that with asking that coach, find kind of a third party and ask to do some feedback or, you know, written feedback, whatever that is. I think feedback is extremely important. I'm laughing because Patrick Campbell had a different approach to this. He just hired a psychologist and had like 30 friends of himself and interviewed Wow. You know, you may learn something. He He did that. He did that. He also talked about it on my podcast about it. That was really interesting. And I was just like, Patrick, are you serious? He's like, yeah. And I also have a speech. uh, What was it? A speech Speech pathologist? Yeah, yeah, to to check his speeches and everything. I'm maybe super aware about stuff because I feel like I'm a good speaker. But then I started to be like, okay, wait, I don't have a speech pathologist. Maybe I'm not that good, you know? So like maybe I need to learn how to present correct stuff. There's so, always ways to get better at everything. Yeah, but come on. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I think about that, I think, oh gosh, am I saying like, am I saying, um, I, <laughs> I get so focused. Yep. So it's true. It, there's yep. always ways to improve on your personal life, your professional life, different areas of growth. And when you're a founder CEO, you don't have a boss. And so you have to seek it out to figure out where I highly you recommend to. anyone to start a podcast, record 30 episodes and listen to all of them back while you're editing them yourself because then you hear yeah. exactly how you sound. So Yeah, I don't listen to myself on podcasts. <laughs> it is interesting. It is interesting how the quality changed from what I did in the very first episode yeah. to now the third, like this is, I don't know, this must be episode 35 or something in, in one hour conversations with also very experienced speakers for most of them. And yeah, I kind of highly recommend. It's also expensive though, in terms of time and commitment and everything. Hey, you can build a business out of it. It's pretty good. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Congrats. In case your company it. doesn't work out. Then. Yeah. We have a podcast called Unlocking Revenue. It's awesome. Yeah. Well, but we'll it's have not you a personal on. one, right? Like if you... No. Oh, okay. No, no, no. Yeah, okay. I should go there as well. Yeah, we'll, we'll bring you on. I know. I'm already booked. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> can't wait oh it's so good alexa if you have time right now in general to write because you're also you're quite present on linkedin right now and i yes. i really like what you guys are doing on the focus community i don't know you have a name for it right like now i'm hovering over slack ah oh, the focus product let's sales community there you go yes i really like what you're doing and how you bring the stuff together specifically i saw the quality of the community in the sense of the level of 
the questions and the discussions that are going on in the community are quite interesting. So like, it seems Thank to you. me that you're really targeting the correct people, right? Like we're talking about quota. We're not talking about just like general concepts in the mm-hmm. air. It's, they're really, really specific questions. Is there some kind of topics that you feel like that you are really passionate about that you write about right now or like that you feel that are coming up in the community? It's something that is just on top of mind of people. Like what is it right now that is going on? Yeah, I'll say, first of all, thank you for those kind words about the community. It means a lot coming from you. I'll say, before I answer that question, our community has been very intentional. We have really wanted to build a community that is actually educating and driving the category of product-led sales. And so we kick out people that are spammy or kind of tell people you can't ask that type of question. We monitor and make sure that We don't just ignore it and let it go. We're very intentional about how we drive that community. In terms of content that I'm excited about, usually I spend a lot of time writing and thinking about the future of go-to-market. So that could be anything in that you see in the community or on my LinkedIn from, you know, what does sales compensation look like in a PLG world to what does the future look like of PQLs and PQAs? Really, there's a ton that we talk about and that I have on my mind always. I think something that I want to get more into is being more kind of vocal about my sounding story and having more perspectives there, kind of the building in public. I usually focus more on building product-led sales category rather than building a, the POCUS business. But I don't know. I might, I might start diving into that more and see how it goes. I want to do a couple of fact-checking surveys in the market, you know, like we're talking about a lot of things. And I think my data set is it's as an advisor, it's kind of OK, you know, like, OK, a couple of companies that I can compare frameworks with and so forth. But what I really want to check is actually how many companies are doing what they claim that they do. So, for instance, mm. I want to do surveys with hopefully a couple hundred of people who are responding from sales that tell me whether they are actually incentivized on expansion. Mm-hmm. rather than just like normal quota deals. And yep. this kind of stuff is very interesting. And I fully intend to use the entire power of my network for this because I usually get a four to 500 answers in, in average, wow. which is really, really cool. This is one of so the cool. very few boons that I started to realize as well as I build my own community around my own brand. Mm-hmm. If you want to run a survey on anything, as a company that never built a community or anything for like three, 400 questions of anything, and you don't have a community, that is yeah. an expensive research endeavor. A hundred percent. That's why community is just so valuable. It is really, yeah. really valuable. No. We do a um, product-led sales benchmark report every year, which I'll loop you into for this year. Uh, and the first year, it was like pulling teeth to, to get respondents. And the next year, once we had the community, it was like, all right, I'll just send out a post and, and see what happens. <laughs> so I can definitely attest to that. Yeah, we should do this together. Welcome to the yeah. product team where we just bring tell- people together <laughs> and then work together. <laughs> I'll tell my head of marketing, Ashley drinks her champagne. She'll loop you in to the product or sales benchmark report. <laughs> yeah, we should do that. We should do a wine episode. That's going to be good. All right. Let's so, do it. If you could go back any time of years in, in, in the industry right now, Would it be some company where you would have loved to be a fly on the wall? You're not allowed to say that you would invest in some companies because that's always easy in hindsight. But is there some company where you would have loved to be around and and just see how things were run? HubSpot is the one that comes top of mind to me. They, first of all, the people that have come out of HubSpot are incredible and have gone on to do really awesome things. What I admire about them specifically is the brand and the content and the community they started similar to Pocus, or Pocus started similar to HubSpot, where it was really strong. We're going to build a category. We're going to kind of build it with our community. We're going to be really strong on content. And then starting to kind of chip away at different features until building the entire platform. So I, I've had coffee with like Kit, the CMO before, and it was probably the most interesting hour-long coffee I had in a while. And just picking his brain about the early days. And I think both in terms of how they grew, as well as the People, the just caliber of talent that have come out of that company is really impro- is something I would have wished to see the rise of. Yeah, it's really funny. Like, at the, I think at this point, I interviewed half of the ex leadership team of HubSpot. The only there person I'm really missing is right now Brian Halligan. <laughs> I just really there want to go. talk to him. Yeah. Yeah, but I think he just had a viral post. 
Here's a tip, by the way. If you want to get any podcast guests or like you want to talk to someone and they just had a viral post, do not reach out to them. You're just going to be <laughs> drowning in the sea. Like just make a reminder in three months when they don't post anymore, you know, like when Brian Halligan went to holidays and then he comes back after three weeks. That's where you strike. That's where he has actually like, oh, I should go on a podcast again. You're not asking him when he's on the height of like some attention. It's just not where you totally. do. But yeah, yeah, total fangirl from HubSpot. I, I totally get it. Totally get it. Yeah. They they should, if you have any openings, HubSpot, I'm available for head of something interim <laughs> next year. All right, cool. I'll let them know. Um, Alexa, should people get in touch with you? And if so, how and when? And do you want people to contact you at all? Yeah, I love chatting with people about anything go-to-market, product-led sales. You can chat with me on LinkedIn, on Twitter. You can join our community and DM me on Slack there as well. Twitter? Is that, I don't know. What is that? <laughs> All right. I'm sorry. X. <laughs> We're Xing these days instead of tweeting. <laughs> what a fun rebrand. We're not going to go yes. into this, Alexa. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. This is awesome. Booyah kasha. <laughs> Done. Thank you so much for listening to The Product Tea with Leah. If you don't have enough yet, you can subscribe to my podcast right now on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or you can head to my website, leahtarin.com which is L-E-A-H-T-H-A-R-I-N.com, where you can find much more of my material or just want to work with me. 